read it, but we're going to dwell on that. And I did assign chapters, oops, I'm in the thick here, 13 1 and 13 2, but I'm going to make that due Monday. And probably tonight, I'm going to, I, I made some changes on the European exploration map. Deal with it. I love maps. But, uh, so, <laughs> but I'll get that map out there for you. Uh, I just made a few changes. I found a better map. And can't emphasize enough what a big deal it was that maps, perspective, and art, they all relate. And there's another one of those days the universe changes that fits in really well. And since I like it so much, we might have watched one of those, but I don't know exactly when. Let me do this really quick. El Greco. I know, I just want to say El Greco. Give me one sec. We have time at the end of the year. We should go through and watch all the decisive battles videos. <laughs> I don't want to be I think they're pretty fun. Sorry, that just isn't working. Seemed off to me, but I don't know nothing about birds. There are two bald eagles like sitting right next to each other. There's a lot of bald eagles this year. It's what we would call an eruption year because there's like so many. Um, which means because they're super territorial, they're going out and looking for other places to uh, find food. They're going away from the lakes, I guess. I've seen some out in my field, and I think we have some like. We have a resident fox. Well, it was real. It was like it was. I think the year before we moved into our house, it would have been 2005. My neighbor had this little Yorkie that got picked up by a beagle. Oh, dang! I just went to a beagle. So like we drove up to a lake in like the middle of nowhere and just opened the crate and all the eagles would walk into the distance, like the Montana State. Okay. Eagle birds, I'm really mad at birds. We have a coronavirus. We're out here in mass, and what do birds do? They just keep doing bird stuff. Think about it for a second. They just totally and flagrantly brush that in our face. Who's with me? Birds. They go watch the birds in class. And uh, yeah, think about it for a second. Were the bald eagles wearing a mask? Just birds doing bird things. Tired of it. You imagine if like half dog and mouse has to cause coronavirus? Mouse mm -hmm. can. Yeah. And dogs can too. Oh, but it can't really spread. It's not super common though. Like I'm saying, like, what if it was really common? That'd be so sad. Cats can hurt. Dogs can hurt. Okay. So got the Northern Renaissance, went through Raphael. You want to see the great Raphael again? No, you gotta admit, that is just amazing. That's so cool, the School of Athens. Oh, and then one more time with the uh, Chubby Little Angels. <laughs> so let's do just a couple more things about Northern Renaissance art. I mentioned Van Eyck, our Nobelian wife. But this is one, let me get, um, you see the mirror back here? See it? There's the back of them, and then in front, it's hard to see there. He drew himself into the mirror. And that kind of detail is unheard of in medieval art. So uh, you don't need no Biden, but I just put him down. Van der Biden was another one of these Dutch artists. The reason I put him in there, though, is look how art had changed. And so, yes, it's a very religious matter, but look at the details in the faces. Isn't that just remarkable how things have changed so much? And you can really get this humanistic idea 
the, the people are important. I know there might be some problems with that. If people are important, why not get really rich and the heck with everybody else? Because I'm important. So there's elements that are problematic there. But see the faces here? Look at the details. Aren't those just amazing? And that's a time with pretty crude brushes and the oil-based paint was pretty shaky. Uh, here's another one, the money lender and the wife. Not even it just a, a regular secular daily life of a situation they didn't like to put in these religious paintings because usury law still existed. But see the coins there? Oh, there. Let's get to it. Look at the detail in the mirror. Isn't that look? Isn't that cool? I'm not sure how I got it to do this. I don't know what I did. I just want the circle to form. I thought, oh, that looks kind of cool, so I left it. And the book, even the print. Now, the thing about it is, is that this was so revolutionary that you could, now they had the technology, the techniques to re, um, replicate life. You can imagine how when photography came, it's like, ooh, we have to change everything for art. And here's another Van Eyck, the man in the turban. You see the lines in his face. But Bruegel the Elder might be my favorite of the Northern Renaissance artists. I love Bruegel. He did have religious scenes, even when he didn't have religious scenes, but they were all, in reality, Dutch, Northern Flanders life. And where it's Flanders, this area right here. And so there's a massive museum of uh, the, the Belgian State Museum. And it basically has a whole wing of just Bruegel the Elder and Bruegel the Younger. You might be asking, that's his son. But these are wonderful paintings of Dutch life or the Flanders life with all these little parables and stories and all the details of people in here. And um, every single one of these has a little example of Dutch, um, of a Dutch parable. Uh, and, but here's this Tower of Babel. And yes, he shows the tower, but in behind all these symbols of Dutch life. Here's another one, the Mad Mag. And... Um, this is a destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but he puts it as parts of the wars that are going on in the Netherlands. I love the beggars. Not our, you know, the begging on the side. It's pretty common to wear a hat like that when you're begging. I love the blind leading the blind. The parable of it off into a cliff. Oh yeah. Here is uh, another one of Dutch life, and these are all, I have um, been home with all of it. Um, it says everything that went through, or every parable it, it says, and some, um, you know, pie in the sky, and there's are pies up there. But uh, it's also, um, it's very earthy, um, you know, showing real life, uh, I need the baby with the bath water. And uh, here, that's just a, an outhouse. You can guess what's sticking out there. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And, I, I, okay, I like Rubel, but his winter scenes are amazing. And harvest scenes, children's games. I think you get the point. This one is just beautiful. And I love this with the ice skaters out there. And this, this was done in 1550. Yeah. So the, you have Rubel the Elder and Rubel the Younger. Yes. Very imaginative. Hey, your imagination goes on the plate. Uh, yeah. And I love to see you have like a, a, a scenes from um, Bethlehem and you know, the judgment of Christ. And it's in the, a winter scene in Belgium. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, they're huge. They cover half of this wall, three quarters of this wall. Oh, really? Yeah. The School of Athens would be, imagine about the whole wall and maybe five or six feet higher. That's how the school of Athens. It's that one that you're in this museum, and you're kind of, you're walking, you made this run. <laughs> That's literally what it feels like. Yeah. So in the in that school of Athens picture, you have the arch around it, right? Mm -hmm. Is that part of the painting? Or yes. Is that part of the painting. Okay. I, I couldn't tell if that was like the what they had painted it on. Oh sure, like it was like this was under the yeah. 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 How would they have taken that? They like ladder and stuff? Oh, yeah. 
really start painting down the one like walk on the painting. Well, you know, the uh, Michelangelo had this elaborate set of scaffoldings that he designed to do the Sistine Chapel. It's just amazing, I guess. I'm not an expert on scaffolding, but I do. <laughs> Who is an expert on scaffolding? Anybody? Really? Uh, like the peasant wedding. But another one named, okay, I cannot pronounce his name. Anybody? Hieronymus, that's probably it, but Bosch. And Bosch had this witty sense of humor, and he would he would draw these scenes and these creatures, and he's very cynical, uh, very cynical towards a lot of criticism of the church. And I just had to put Bosch on because this is absolutely unreal. It's a garden of earthly delights, and it is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I don't, um, there's fish and they're, he's kissing a duck and, you know, it's on a half shell and there's all kinds of, um, very earthy scenes and uh, sexual scenes. Uh, it, it's the one of the most remarkable paintings ever. It's indescribable. I mean, some of the scenes are just like, I have no idea what this is. And this head floating behind, it's like, wow. And so at this time where, remember, mannerism started using your own imagination, Bosch started doing that. So we start seeing the word we'll use in a few hundred years later would be surreal. Surrealism. So he had the, he's using the perspective and the artistic techniques and then drawing just fantastical scenes. Can you go back to that weird one? Or this? Uh, the one after that, with the crazy, that one. Okay, so you have the head, and it looks like he has a hat? Yeah. Uh, is that me, or is there legs going down and riding on the boats? Where? Here? No, like the big white thing. Yeah, these look like legs, yeah. That's so supposed to be like thighs. Squatting. And there's people inside of here, and you notice there's kind of a hummingbird leaving like a devil around, and they got ears holding a knife being on top of people. Yeah. The... No. He's just having fun. And then, of course, Christ carrying the, the cross might be, look at the characters around, and then Christ in the middle. That's really well, it's trying to show them as like evil. It's, it's, it's really good. Let's go ahead and get to, we, we, got, we can go him. Another artist we do have to know, there is a German artist, and it's Albert Durer. And Durer um, really focused on the, the, um, in the shapes of the bodies, um, very realistic art. I like the praying hand. That is the art, but that's really cool. Uh, that's a self-portrait of him. That's that neat. Is he in drag or something? Huh? Is he in drag or something? That's how people dress. Right. Okay. Are you thinking of wearing men or women's clothes? No, Renaissance clothing was. That's just they, people would wear breeches, but yeah. And and don't don't think too much about. Uh, a stigma of men dressed as, as women or vice versa. That was not, especially for men, that was not a stigma as it's going to become 20 years later. And so, moving on from art. Last couple of things we got to get about this. As we've talked about some of the changes in philosophy and things, we have to get to a development called civic humanism. So let's do civic humanism very quickly. Civic humanism. So this is dropped up at the same time and it fits in with art and those changes that start with petrol. So it's important to see how these tie in together. And the thing is this for humanism. Education has to be more than just simply for education's sake. It must be to um, for individual advancement or virtue. One of the things that was happening were, and um, a lot of criticism of the, and I'll get to it more, we'll run it in a second. But criticism of these brand new universities are people who go there and learn these great things and then they just stay there and teach that to other people who are going to stay there and teach that. And they should be promoting a better society. So public service should be the key. This is a little like uh, the, um, the Stoics in ancient Greek philosophy. And so this goes back to the Greeks. And I mentioned these once before, but Plato talked about philosopher kings. Socrates said we all have a duty to society. Yes, he also didn't want people to tell him what to do. And Plato wanted uh, philosopher kings and 
um, armies made up of lovers. So there's some things they kind of ignored with that. But lastly, so the whole concept was you shouldn't go into deep into, or it should not be emphasized this scholarship and learning and only just trying to learn the, uh, every detail to go teach to other people. But practical politics and politics, it's hard not to say politics in a country like this where we just think, we think it's purely of winning and losing elections. That's actually the least important part of politics. Politics are the interaction of people and how things get done. That's politics. And we get bogged down on who's going to win an election, and that's one of the real problems in the United States today. Uh, both political parties, one especially, sees it like a team effort, us against them. But no, politics are how action, the interaction and how things are done. By the way, if you want to be a dictator, you have people worried about the horse race element of politics and not how things get done. Think about it for a second. Look at this, look at this. Okay, I'm going to do what I want. So the man who laid this out, this is Rooney. And this picture, he just kind of makes him look creepy. So I, I took that one. There's actually a picture where he looked good, but that's kind of a creepy one. And Rooney wrote on civic humanism. And you can imagine how the church at first Okay, the church is not going to react that strong, but when the Reformation came partially because of this, boy, did they react. And that's a university in, that's in uh, Bologna. So, another concept that came out of this change in thinking with Petrarch and the new art and the new maps was this idea of virtue. And the virtue is, what is it to be a man? Now, I'm going to be very clear about this. To most of the thinkers, they were thinking literally men. But a better way to look at it is what does it mean to be human? And this is a real concept of individualization, of me, me, as an entity separate from you. Something that we kind of already think about, and it existed before, it was not invented here, this goes, and this is not something that was lost in medieval Europe. And the whole idea is to lead a virtuous life to help others. Now, of course, I think you can see the negative of that. Once you say it's only me, then I can do whatever I want to help my personal well-being. By the way, I thought it was a good idea to put David in there. So, so increasing your own abilities, your own genius, and making yourself a better person. That was virtue. And that's where you get this concept of like the Renaissance man. And this is a real issue, because is virtue important in this concept? Because if virtue is important to make yourself a better person and the quality of a man that is virtuous, then you have to be, you have to learn and function in society beyond personal gain. And does that fit in with the society that's created now? So this is a big shift that's happening. So uh, we're going to skip. Let's skip right here and get right to Machiavelli. The last person we got to get to in this era of this uh, Renaissance is Machiavelli. And he would be best known for writing a book called The Prince, which is really hard to read. I had to read it for class, a political science class. I like college. College. Of course, that's back when it's almost weird to think about it when college, especially public schools, were almost basically free. And that's now completely gone. And that was a conscious decision to make you guys pay more. You know how much it is, but the kindergarten is going to be going down. Well, here, here they're public, so it doesn't cost, but I, I know some places they're not public schools and private, so why, do you know? No, I was wondering. But it, um, I so like it's very interesting, the prices of like the different schools and the You know, here we have, a, you know, we have public kindergarten and public, so we have public K through 12. And so, you know, taxpayers pay for it, so it feels individual stuff. 
but you know, college isn't like that in most preschoolers. So you just look how preschool is. If you know anything about child care and preschool, it's, it's many thousands of dollars. And then college, wow. In fact, I'm just reading about that, how it was a big deal to go from um, free colleges in California to stop the anti war movement. They can pay for all that debt if they can't protest. It's all to put you in the debt. So it's a different world, but back to this, Machiavelli. So Machiavelli was in Florence, and the French had come through, the Borgias took power, then the Medici took power. He was actually a government official. So when we know about him, he had a high government post, but then when the Medici came through, he was actually arrested and tortured. He was in prison and tortured. And I guess the torture was pretty extreme. A lot of, yeah, because he was part of the old regime. There was an old regime. He was uh, the Borgia family had been for a short time after the French invaded. You know, they there was a series of conflicts. And he was in prison, and then the Medici family took over, and the Medici became the Pope. He desperately wanted to ingratiate himself to the Medici family, and he wanted to kind of basically here he was tortured by the Medici. But he wants them to let him back in. He wanted to become part of the Republic again. He would wear his old uh, garb. He had the cloak he wore as a member of the government. He would wear that as kind of this sad reminder of what he used to be after he got out of prison. And he ingratiated himself with that, kind of basically saying, the Medici's were right to torture me because that's what good leaders do. They make hard decisions. So he wrote this book to ingratiate himself as what a prince should do. And what the prince must do is maintain power. So this would become a political guidebook. And this would become known as real politics in the 19th century, where you must do whatever it takes to increase your own personal power. Now, it's been embellished. He wasn't quite as much of an... It almost makes him come out like a, uh, like he's promoting immoral rule. It's more complex than that, but I'm going to give you a very brief explanation of what it was. And so a king must to maintain power. Have you ever heard better be feared than love? That comes from the prince. And that's what he said Medici had to do. He deserved to be tortured. Machiavelli did, because that's how the... Uh, the Medici family controlled Florence and maintained power. If you're loved, they take advantage. By the way, it doesn't quite work that way. It really doesn't work that way. If you're feared, as soon as you turn your back, they, the knives come out. If you're loved, that might not happen. So what he's really doing is, we don't know if he actually meant it, or he's basically saying to the Medici's, Hire me back. I like you guys. You see the same thing when Stalin would um, imprison and torture his former allies. And a lot of them would say, Stalin did the right thing to have my teeth bashed out with a hammer. No, I'm not making that up. Of course, people will say anything to stop torture. Another one, the ends justify the means. Have you heard that? Whatever it takes to get your your ideas, your policy, your kingdom ahead, you must do. The ends justify the means. So basically what it says is whatever you do, it doesn't matter. Whatever you say, it doesn't matter as long as you achieve what you want. But once again, he's telling the Medici, you did perfectly fine by um, uh, promising to bring people together than torturing them. Yes. Here's a good question. Did it work? Did, he, did they take him back? Absolutely not. No. He also wanted, because uh, Medici was um, soon to be Pope, the Medici used to be like all Rome. And so here is the basic elements of it. You need to be strong leaders, and you have to make hard decisions. It's not all bad. But you can imagine what's going to come out of the prince. And I should have typed this in, but I didn't. What's the last conclusion? What kind of leaders would the prince come to justify? 
Yeah, horrible dictators who say, hey, the ends justify the means. It's actually, okay, let me rephrase that. It's really hard to read. It's interesting, but prose from 1520, hard to read. I'm just going to let you know. So that's the prince. And his thought was, we'll bring all of Italy together under a ruthless Medici empire. The problem was this. Everyone's fighting wars over France or over Italy. Actually, you can say it started in 1549, but we'll go with 1515. There was what's called the Habsburg Ballet War. And Italy was the battleground. So when he wrote this, the prince right here, it's while Italy, I'm sorry, Italy was a battleground between France and Spain slash Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. So this still be under humanism. Yeah. Okay. So this is how humanism kind of comes crashing down. So they're talking about civic good. They're talking about these things, but at the same time, what's really happening? Bigger countries are seeing there's Italy's rich. Let's get it. Does that make sense? So that up and down the peninsula, they're raging and fighting a war. Italy, and then Rome is kind of the prize. The French took it and got a pope favorable to them. The pope tried to show independence, and then the Spanish took it. Heck, France even unified with the Muslim Ottoman Empire to attack the Habsburgs, which at a time with such strong religious feelings as the Crusades had just happened, this is like quite the move. What a, okay, the Hatsburg Ballet War. This is one, it's a pretty amazing war. We're going to find out something that's going to happen to Europe next room. Pretty much for the next three months of class. <laughs> All the way up here. There's going to be one war followed by another war. And then they're going to start fighting. And then there's going to be more wars. And then they'll have a war. It's like the perpetual European civil war. And you notice there really have been no, hardly any major wars at all in Europe since World War II. They fought themselves out. You have no kidding. The fascists are back. Just wait. So, to tell you really quick, by the time the prince was being written, fighting over Italy was between Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire and the, uh, so he's Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. We'll come back to Charles V. We cannot escape Charles V. By the way, this is his chin. This is what we call inbreeding. And just <laughs> wait. I'll show you some more Habsburg shin, chins. Here is What's the note? France, um, Francois of uh, first Francis, for us America, for us English speakers. And yes, Francis of, Fra of France was known as Big Nose. I don't know why. What do we get? Cousins marrying cousins. The Industrial Revolution was a big deal. Part of the reason was they had a train where you leave your town and not marry your cousin. Inbreeding went down. Write that down. Don't marry your cousin. Next. And in the middle was the Pope, who was the Medici. And so here's Machiavelli thinking, okay, well, with the Medici Pope, this could be an avenue for the Medici to take over Italy. They'll look to me and say, wow, he helped us, and Machiavelli would be in a big position. Well, he's in the middle. The French had taken Rome, or threatened to take Rome, and, and Clement, and the Pope before him, Julius II, the guy who did the Sistine Chapel, got Michelangelo, the warrior Pope, who the French defeated. They had to give concessions, Clement had concessions on both sides. They're really in the middle. So this war is raging across Italy, and the last thing, in 1527, the Spanish and the, and the Empire's army destroyed Rome. Charles V had a bunch of mercenaries, and these mercenaries a lot from what is now Switzerland, and they hadn't been paid. So they were surrounding Rome, and they hadn't been paid. They were trying to force Clement to give up, basically, uh, control over much of the church land and church, uh, appointing bishops, etc. And the Swiss mercenaries decided, you know, we've had enough. And they stormed the defenses of Rome, destroyed Rome, robbed it blind, took the Pope, put him on a board, a door, supposedly, and hauled him through town, throwing manure at the Pope. By the way, yes, of course, they're all Catholics. But not that that would matter, 
but it's even more amazing, and they destroyed Rome. And this, you could argue, would be the end of the total Italian Renaissance. Okay, when, when uh, the French attacked, you said ended in Florence, this kind of ended. And a couple th things about this. It ended that, and what do you think happened to Italy? First off, the Pope and the Papal States lost power. The Pope would never again be a major political player in Europe after this. He was definitely lost power after the Babylon captivity back in the 14th century, but they lost power and Italy would become bitterly divided. And kind of a backwater. So Italy would be divided between many different little kingdoms and principalities all the way until the 1860s when Italy would be unified. So that's a long, long time. So Machiavelli's dream ended. A little bit of art, a little bit of this. Let's get to two more, three more people. What year did the Habsburg start? Or was it 1515? I put down 1515, even though arguably you could say 1549. And the war, there's basically going to be four Habsburg ballet wars. So you don't need to know all the details about this. Off and on, again, this would fight. I'll come back to this war again. So don't worry about this. There'll be two big treaties in Turin and Nice. Both sides had massive deaths. Arguably, the French lost, but not quite. But here is the, the, the Treaty of uh, Nice, a very old Clement. And I just love, you can really see the distinctive characteristics of Francis and Charles. And there's Philip, his son. And that chin was a lot bigger. He had the Habsburg chin. Just wait. I'll show you some chins that will blow your mind. So with that, another person we have to get to before we get to anybody else is Gutenberg. We'll come back to this, but Gutenberg would perfect movable print. They, they've done print where they would carve a picture or word into one board and make reproductions on one page. So you can imagine how that was pretty slow and you only could make one copy. They would make like comic books of like biblical scenes. That came from China. What they used is movable print where they would actually put individual letters and then they could change it, put different words. And once you had that, you could have printing after printing. And the first thing he printed was a Bible, the Gutenberg Bible became the first printed Bible. And uh, one just went through Bozeman to a year ago, but it couldn't go through the COVID. But they sometimes tour Gutenberg Bibles and these printed Bibles. But once that happened, they spread different ideas about exploration, the Reformation, uh, a lot of smut, um, because humans are humans. All kinds of stuff like that, but there's another biggie, and this came from your quiz yesterday. They started using more and more of the vernacular. What's the vernacular? Common um, language. Okay. So instead of writing everything in Latin, they start started using Italian or German or French, and they were, every city had their own dialect. But once they started using the printing press and say, okay, this is going to be German. And high German became the the the, uh, um, the German that we use the most. All the other dialects started to kind of die down, and that became the language. So there is Gutenberg. I can't emphasize enough the importance of Gutenberg. We will come back to Gutenberg. But this would be the first capitalism. Capital, that's the machines. And printing shops would appear all over. Someone buy the machines, and then they use the machines to produce goods in a market that people want. I'll explain capitalism more later. But, um, so this is where Gutenberg started, and this is the German they spoke here, now it's part of France. But then it was Germany, or then they spoke German. Higher elevation, so that was high German. Low German, up here. But since the first printing presses were here, that became the vernacular. When I first heard high German, when I take German in, in high school and college, uh, and I wish I was never more of it, but uh, I thought, you know, I thought like high as in like more normal verb. Does that make sense? No, it's just elevation. <laughs> Actually, kind of made me feel a little better about it. But, oh, the Northern Renaissance then. Uh, the Low Countries, England, France, Germany, 
And what you got to get is Christian humanism. Christian humanism, they would focus on uh, not the classics, unlike the Italian Renaissance, but on early Christian writers. And so we're talking about St. Augustine all the way back into uh, and Capella. And they wanted to reform the Catholic Church. But the problem with this is for the church, is this reform of the Catholic Church would lead to criticism of the church. And if you see this, this is another Bruegel. This is actually Bruegel the Younger. I know, you excited? And this is Bethlehem. And here is the birth. So this is a, a scene from uh, the uh, for, for Christianity of the birth of Jesus. But look where it's drawn. It's a winter's day in Belgium. <laughs> I was going to say, it doesn't snow in Bethlehem. Yeah, it doesn't snow a lot. There. So, okay, we're not going to go. Um, I'll come back to that. But that's what we have, the two different types of this. We'll come back to Erasmus. I, I do hit with the... Uh, with the uh, bah, 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 What's the word I'm looking for? Help me. Reformation. So, everyone write down... European exploration and conquest. Because at the same time, because of the new kind of thinking of the Renaissance, we have exploration. Yeah. Two questions. What were the two things in a Christian humanism? What part do you mean? Like Christian humanism is it focused on writers? Yeah, focus on early Christian writers and they and they begin and it was they want to reform the church. So, um, focus on early Christian writers. The Italian Renaissance was all classics. They look more at the early Christian writers. And then it's a big one, reform the church. But reforming the church led to criticism of the church. And we'll do the Reformation. He, he's also included with the Northern Renaissance, but we'll do Th uh, Thomas More and uh, Erasmus. So, are we at the end of the Renaissance? And end of yeah, the end of the Renaissance. But even though exploration ties in directly to it. So let me do this. Let me just start this one thing in here. Ready? Exploration. And we're talking about here, it's not just the discovery of the new world. This is literally going to lead to a new, totally new way of thinking about the world, a new way of trade, something that you've heard of globalization. It started with this. The world completely changed with Renaissance thinking. And that's the Spanish, and this is a very stylized picture of the Spanish in on uh, Arawak Island. And so that's supposed to be Columbus, a priest. That's supposed to be American Indian, and of course flamingos. So one thing I do have to say: the Chinese almost certainly made it to the New World by the Pacific. And the reason I'm putting this one in here is because this was at a time where there was more spread of information. And so somewhere before, uh, this is Admiral Zhen Ji, he was, this is his lifespan. So somewhere around 1420, with his massive ships, they sailed and dominated the Indian Ocean. They went all the way to Madagascar, all the way to South Africa, down to probably New Guinea, all of what uh, is now Indonesia, and almost certainly they made it all the way to the Sandwich Islands, maybe even Samoa, or the Sandwich Islands. What the British call the Hawaii, what we call the Hawaiian Islands today. And there's good evidence they made it all the way to the new um, North America. And the reason we're mentioning him is first off, look at their massive you know, ships that they would bring the supply. Look how much bigger they were than um, this is the Santa Maria, the St. Maria, one of Columbus's ships. Look at the size of this thing. Yeah. You know how big our like modern ships are? Mass, yeah. 150, 200,000 pounds, yeah. These. Well, I mean, these, like, those must have been like a sight to behold, too. Yeah, it was like seeing one of, the, one of these ships, and when the Portuguese saw these ships, Chinese ships trading, in like early 1500s, they just, oh my gosh. But. They weren't very armed. They weren't armed. 
And so the point is, he sailed all over here. In fact, he went to India, and that's where the Portuguese first landed. So the Chinese were trading all through this area. So the point is, there's already elements of globalization. The Chinese are setting up trade facilities, and then the Europeans would come in. The problem the Chinese had is um, they were having their own problems, and they're here. So their point of view is, yeah, it's great to trade here, but we're great. We don't need to worry about that stuff. Not realizing what's coming. So there's already a trade route happening, and that's the known world in 1492. By the way, that's a pretty good map, isn't it? Oh, okay. I see it. I see it. Is that a good map? I thought the Canelli's map. I thought the blue was land. No. And so they didn't know what was here, but they knew something was here. But can you see it on the map? Can you see it? Look at the map, everyone. Latitude and longitude. They gridded the map. And the point is this. Once you know you have latitude and longitude, even if you go to this area, which was completely unknown, if you know the latitude, you know where you're at. By the way, they all thought the world was round. Of course they did. They were really smart. Nobody thought the world was flat. Nobody thought the world was flat. So they were more intelligent than us. Yes. Oh, yeah. People back then were heck of a lot smarter than us. In most practical ways, they were. Because they had to do everything for themselves. Yeah, everyone. But they just took this map and went, Doop. And now we have computer speed. So we don't have to think. Yeah. So we get dumb. Dumba. Dumba. So I'm 99% sure I saw a. Uh... Oh my god, I'm not going to do my microphone. I'm going to take it off. Yeah, they're really fun right now. And I've not seen one, and I've seen now uh, a couple of them. Uh, both dark morph and light morph are here right now. So very briefly, I talked to Mr. Kelly. They're really cool. Talk about the uh, a good week here today. Wait, yeah. I will I, see I, you I, tomorrow. Get ready for a map. I want to get uh, Mr. Zarnowski, too. The yeah, the Russian opposition leaders. We're going to be talking about Alexei Navalny, and I'm trying to get him to talk about Alexander with him. Body snatchers. Yeah. You're going to do a fellow worksheet. 